Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to welcome you to today's session where we read this short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This is a brief description of this short story. We have this lead female character who's depressed at the beginning of the story. We find her being all the more repressed through the various systems within which she's caught. And towards the end, we find her sinking deep into an obsessive status where depression becomes almost like an insanity for her. Reading the story, one can find close parallels with that of uh, the author, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. In her own words, only as we live, think, feel and work outside the home do we become humanly developed, civilized and socialized. This in that sense, as Gilman points out rightfully, can be seen as one such story which is advocating the need to bring women outside of the home space, about the need to bring women out of the home space to make them more developed, civilized and socialized and the repercussions of not doing so. The yellow wallpaper has been seen increasingly as a criticism of a culture that undermined a woman's right to intellectual freedom and intellectual development as we would uh, begin to see the unnamed narrator in this story, the woman who is caught within the domestic, uh, domestic space for various reasons. Her intellectual freedom and her intellectual development are curbed by the well-meaning members of the family. The Yellow Wallpaper, as a short story, it was first published in January 1892 and this was written just before her second marriage to Hutton Gilman. The first marriage had failed and she was separated from her husband. And uh, this uh, story, however, was uh, revived only in the early 1970s where a rediscovery of uh, lost works such as uh, Gilman's Yellow Wallpaper, Kate Chopin's The Awakening, Susan Glaspell's A Jury of Her Peers. Yeah, those works were revived only in the 1970s and Yellow Wallpaper also in that sense owes much to the feminist awakening and the feminist rediscovery of uh, lost works and uh, authors. This uh, story is written in the form of a collection of journal entries written by a woman. It can be read as a critique of rest cure to which the author Gilman herself was subjected to during her life after her pregnancy and childbirth. It can also be seen as semi-autobiographical in that sense. Charlotte Perkins uh, Gilman lived from 1860 to 1935. She was a well-known American feminist writer. She had suffered serious postpartum depression and this was during an age in the 19th century which saw women as hysterical and nervous beings. So even when women complained about any difficulties, any pressures or any challenges that they felt in their mind or in their body, it was not seen taken seriously because they were seen as beings who are inherently hysterical and nervous and this was bound to happen. Gilman read a very radical life due to the personal choices that she made. She separated from her husband in 1888. That was also a rare occurrence in the 19th century. Divorce was not a known thing then. Divorce was not an accepted thing then. And uh, nevertheless, she led a very active life writing, traveling and uh, delivering public speeches and making people aware of the need for various social, uh, gender related, uh, racial issues and economic issues. She was someone who spoke prolifically and wrote extensively about a range of things which concerned um, the society during that time. The fact that she, she was a woman did come across as a challenge, but we do find her breaking out of those many shackles and making, leaving a mark of her own. But the ending of her life comes uh, across as being a little disappointing as uh, she committed suicide in the year 1935 on being diagnosed with a form of incurable cancer. As she mentioned in the death note that she left, she chose chloroform over cancer. But a certain strong uh, willingness of her, a, a certain uh, stubbornness of herself comes through even through even in her death. This is a story, uh, the yellow wallpaper is a story which has attracted a lot of critical interest and discussion ever since it was uh, published by the feminist press. In 1992, Catherine 
Golden published this work, The Captive Imagination, a case book on the yellow wallpaper to commemorate the 100 years of reading the yellow wallpaper. This is a story which has been anthologized in numerous collections and different kinds of readings are available about it. Even a recent paper published by Susan Lancer in the year 1989 where she talks about the politics of color in America and critiques the presentation of the yellow wallpaper as a typical white story and as a representative fiction for uh, feminist uh, writing. So in these 100 years it has received a lot of critical attention and has also begun to receive some kind of a resistance in the canonical status that the yellow wallpaper has now come to assume. Gilman herself has written about why she wrote the yellow wallpaper. In her own words it was intended not to drive people crazy but to save people from being driven crazy and it worked. In an extensive note that she left which was also published in this uh, commemorative anthology of the readings of uh, uh, yellow wallpaper, she tells us the story of the story, the yellow wallpaper. I read to you a brief excerpt from Gilman's short piece, Why I Wrote the Yellow Wallpaper. For many years I suffered from a severe continuous nervous breakdown tending to melancholy and beyond. During about the third year of this trouble, I went in devout faith and some faint stir of hope to a noted specialist in nervous diseases, the best known in the country. The wise man put me to bed and applied the rest cure, to which a still good physique responded so promptly that he concluded there was nothing much the matter with me and sent me home with solemn advice to live as domestic a life as far as possible to have but two hours intellectual life a day and never to touch pen, brush or pencil again as long as I lived. This was in 1887. I went home and obeyed those directions for some three months and came so near the borderline of utter mental ruin that I could see over. Then using the remnants of intelligence that remained I, and helped by a wise friend I cast the noted specialist advice to the winds and went to work again. Work the normal life of every human being. Work in which is joy and growth and service, without which one is a pauper and a parasite, ultimately recovering some measure of power. So this is a context from which, this is a context in which uh, Gilman had to write the yellow wallpaper. It is semi-autobiographical. It's also a critique of this rest cure, which almost drove her uh, crazy. This story had received a mixed critical reception. And initially, when this story was looking for a publisher, it is said that the editor of the Atlantic uh, Monthly had rejected it because the editor read it and said, I could not forgive myself if I made others as miserable as I have made myself. It was not seen as a story which would encourage, on the contrary, it was seen as a story. The, the, the graphic details and almost uh, gross ending, it was, made, it was uh, uh, expected that it would make people very, very miserable. And another uh, editor, William Dean Howells, when he reprinted Gilman's story in the 1920, he also had written about it being terrible and too wholly dire and too terribly good to be printed. So the, the responses are uh, varying from two different ends of the spectrum. And one of the uh, readers, when it was first published, an anonymous reader, he's also said to have written to the editors and publishers asking for a, uh, some kind of a uh, censure over this work. This is what it read. The story could hardly, it would seem, give pleasure to any reader and to many whose lives have been touched through the dearest ties by this dread disease. It must bring the keenest pain. To others whose lives have become a struggle against heredity of mental derangement, such literature contains deadly peril. Should such stories be allowed to pass without severest censure? Yeah. So this is a work which had to outlive and also had to fight with such uh, uh, difficult reviews and challenges. But there have been other views, more recent ones, which an impressive account of why women who live a monotonous lives are susceptible to mental illness. And now reading the story 
along with the notes shared by the author herself. It makes a lot of sense. And uh, it's also said that this gives us perspectives on major issues of gender with which we still grapple. And uh, it, it's a story which enables us to look at the origin of women's subjugation, about the central role of work as a definition of self. It gives us new strategies for rearing and educating future generations, yeah, especially women, to create a humane and nurturing environment. So these are the many enabling and uh, promising factors as far as this uh, story is concerned. The narrator of the story is a nameless woman and we fi find her transition from being a hesitant writer to a reader of the wallpaper and the inability to write, the lack of permission to pursue what she likes her the most, to write her journal, to articulate her feelings that almost drives her to the point of being mad. And the story celebrates this need to get out of confinement. And we find the narrator, this nameless woman, being determined to solve the wallpaper pattern. As uh, confusing as it sounds, the story is about, if you try to break it down to certain plot elements, the story is about this woman trying to make sense of uh, a wallpaper which is there in this room where she's confined when she's not allowed to do anything else constructive and how that also accentuates her journey into complete madness and complete uh, uh, absurdity. Let's try and go through this uh, story very quickly focusing on some of the important elements which will be helpful for your understanding and reading. At the outset of the story we get to know that the narrator along with the character John who is we get to know her husband, they have rented out an ancestral hall for the summer. It's a colonial mansion, it's a hereditary estate. We also get to know about the kind of social class to which this family belongs, to which this nameless narrator belongs, that they can afford such a summer residence. And in the beginning itself, in the first page of the story itself, we get a sense of how this woman is never taken seriously, how her complaints and her opinions are never um, taken seriously. There is this statement which comes in the first page, John laughs at me of course, but one expects that in a marriage. It also tells us about the state of marriage within which she is now where she is certainly married to a good man who is kind enough to take her to a summer residence to allow her to spend the summer recovering there. But we also get to know that there are certain inconveniences in this marriage which would begin to unsettle her further. And in the beginning we also get to know about the kind of profession that this husband has. John is a physician. That makes him all the more qualified to pronounce judgments on the mental or physical state that this woman is. And we get to know that her brother is also a physician and that she disagrees with their ideas and her personal beliefs are entirely different. But there is helplessness. But what is one to do? because she's not allowed to do anything on her own. She cannot make any decisions on her own. She is under confinement. And the room which has been allotted to her, where she is in confinement, where her family is taking care of her, she does not like that room a bit. But uh, she also finds it difficult to articulate this dislike because she is in the midst of a family where they all love her. And we find love and care being presented as things which would, which are not uh, uh, making things easier for this woman. Love and care come across as being an extension of a patriarchal device which is used to further, uh, further suppress her and further repress her uh, desires. And when you read through the story, we get to know that she is also not allowed to write. In the end of the first section, she uh, says, there comes John and I must put this away. He hates to have me write a word. And we also get to know that this channel through which she is communicating to us, the diary or the journal that she is maintaining, that is not acceptable to her family because they think that that's also one of the causes for her depression and for the state of being that she is in. Uh, now, we are, we are given brief insights into the time frame. We get to know at the beginning of the second section that they've been there for about two weeks and she talks about her uh, increasing um, 
displeasure being confined and there are many thoughts that she continues to share with us. I encourage you to read that on your own. And there is also another figure here which you can see in page 650 which is John's sister. Such a dear girl as she is and so careful of me. She also must not uh, find this woman writing and writing is something which is clearly a taboo thing for our narrator. And uh, uh, you see the way the uh, section ends, there is sister on the stairs. Yeah, so we are almost privy to the thoughts and the emotions that the narrator is feeling as and when she is writing, she can hear the sister coming up the stairs and she suddenly stops writing, we can uh, get to know. And the next section begins after the 4th of July, which is, uh, uh, which is the celebration of the American Independence Day and we get to know that they had visitors. But the narrator is not allowed to do anything. Yeah, in the first section, John thought it might do me good to see a little company. So we just had mother and Nellie and the children down for a week. Of course, I didn't do a thing. Jenny sees to everything now. So here is a woman who's not allowed to write, who's not allowed to participate in any of the activities at home. She's been asked to take rest and it is rest cure that she's been subjected to in the form of a treatment. And she's not allowed to do anything constructive or creative. Or, or even not allowed to help others in the family. And this becomes all the more difficult and uh, uh, repressing for this uh, woman. And as the story progresses, we get to know that uh, left with nothing else to do, she gets obsessively interested in the wallpaper, which is there in this room where she's confined. She gets interested. She initially does not like the room because of the wallpaper, because it looks very eerie. But now she gets all the more interested in it and she feels that she likes the room because of the wallpaper. And we find uh, uh, a fairly long segment in page six, 651 where she continues to talk about the wallpaper almost to the point of an obsession. And from this time onwards we find this story taking a different turn and a different twist altogether. We find the character getting increasingly obsessed with the idea of the wallpaper and she begins to imagine that there are women. Initially she thinks there is just one woman who is caught within that wallpaper. Then she imagines that there are multiple women who are caught within the wallpaper and they need to be rescued. She begins to tear the wallpaper down in this attempt to uh, help them out and uh, she, uh, we, we also get to know the time period towards the uh, end that they have by now uh, spent almost three months which is quite similar to the time that the author Gilman also had spent in confinement as part of the rest cure treatment and on the last day things completely go out of control the last day when they were supposed to leave this uh, summer house we uh, find that this nameless narrator her fall into the realms of in insanity is almost complete and when the husband comes back home, when John comes back home to take her, she had locked herself within this room which she never liked initially where she's imagining that women are caught within the wallpaper and she imagines them coming out and creeping on the floor and she also begins to creep on the floor. When the husband manages to get in and witness this scene, it totally freaks him out. This is how the final segment reads. I kept on creeping just the same. But I looked at him over my shoulder. I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane. And I've pulled off most of the paper, so you can't put me back. Now, why should that man have fainted? But he did. And right across my path by the wall, so that I had to creep over him every time. We find John fainting at the sight of his wife creeping all over the floor, which certainly would be uh, an act which would freak perhaps any of us out of our wits. And this ending is symbolic because we find that just like the woman that the narrator imagines being caught within the wallpaper, she also thinks she needs, her, needs to find her way to freedom. Where she's not allowed to walk out, she chooses to creep out stealthily. And this is an act which can be replicated to the act of writing as well. She's not allowed to write. In, in front of other people, we find the narrator in the beginning, from the beginning itself, she had to do that in, in a very creepy way, in a uh, stealthy way, that she had 
taught herself to creep out and do certain things which she is not allowed to do otherwise normally in public. There are some interesting insights that we get about the relation between John and uh, the narrator. If you come to page uh, 652 in the second uh, section in the second part, there is uh, 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 an instance where the narrator, this woman is trying to talk about her fears and concerns to John, her husband, but we find that he almost dismisses them, but not in a rude way, in a very uh, caring and loving way, which comes across as being all the more nauseous to uh, this woman. Um, there's a segment where John tells his wife, bless her little heart, said he with a big hug. She shall be as sick as she pleases, but now let's improve the shining hours by going to sleep and talk about it in the morning. The husband is trying to baby talk the wife, not giving her the, uh, the self for the agency. We find the husband referring to the wife in the third person and not just in the second person. We notice here that she's not, he's not saying bless your little heart, bless her little heart. She shall be as sick as she pleases. This is how one talks to little children. We refer to them in the third person and do not address them as you because uh, an idea of a self, an idea of an agency is not implied there. So there are many instances in the story which tells us that John is not necessarily a vicious man. He is not a bad sort of a person. He is not a wife beater. He is not someone who is not taking care of his wife. On the contrary, he is someone who comes across as being too caring and too loving to the point that the care and the love being shown there becomes only extensions of the many rules and regulations that the wife is expected to follow. He is willing to spend money on her, but at the same time, not willing to allow her to do the one thing that she loves the most, writing. And it is what he expects in return as a uh, favor is that she completely denies herself, her existence, her likes and uh, ignore her dislikes and also not to give her the privilege of the company that she desires, not to give her the privilege of working. Here we realize that the woman not being allowed to work becomes, uh, it, it has a very drastic effect on the self of this woman, on her health and on her uh, uh, mental capacity. The story in that sense can be seen as a narration which places the contestation between freedom and confinement. And there are a series of such dichotomous things that uh, we can find male versus female. Yeah. It would be impossible to imagine a male character being confined like this because for a man, confinement is not seen as a good thing. It was not seen as a good thing in the 19th century. It is still not seen. But on the contrary, preventing a woman from doing certain things, preventing a woman from socializing, preventing uh, a woman from accessing the freedom that she uh, deserved or she desired, that was seen as the best cure for any kinds of mental depression or any kind of, uh, even for any kind of uh, uh, bodily weakness. We also find this uh, very ambivalent relation between protection and suppression. It, to, to such an extent that uh, protection becomes another way of suppressing and having control over the woman um, who also happens to be his wife. And it also becomes difficult to differentiate between the show of affection and the show of dominance because they are presented as two sides of the coin in this patriarchal system where the show of affection is also with an expectation that the one who is, be, who is at the receiving end will also listen to whatever is being told, will also accept this dominance. So affection and dominance are not necessarily seen as two different things, but we find them coexisting in a peculiar way. And finally, we also see the role of the, the power structures uh, uh, initiated by the family as well as the society. Here we find this woman being comfortably placed in, a, in an upper middle class aristocratic setup. 
where the family becomes the important power structure for her, where the family is the one who is not allowing her to do certain things while also enabling her uh, recovery in a way that they think uh, she would benefit. The story also enables us to look at the many ways in which gender gets played out. There is a focus on aspects of womanhood, motherhood, domesticity and marriage. And we find that during the, this period of confinement, there is a way in which these seemingly feminine notions are also not attributed to the woman. She is not allowed to write. At the same time, she is not allowed to participate in the household shows. She is not uh, allowed to be a good uh, host. She is not allowed to take care of her baby. She is only asked to take rest and stay alone and do not do anything, do not think, do not write, do not work, just eat, sleep and take good care of herself. And this again on the contrary, these expectations which do not allow her a, self, a sense of self or a sense of agency, it is also a gendered expectation because she is forced to remain in confinement she is forced not to express herself through writing or not to associate with, there is a mention of two cousins whom she would uh, love to engage with, but they are seen as too stimulating by John. So, these sort of confinements and these sort of restrictions and they are seen as an extension of these gendered expectations. And what would happen when, when these ideals are challenged or rejected or destroyed? The story in some way shows us that. The moment this gendered self is unable to perform the roles expected of her as a woman, as a mother, as someone who is an enabler in the domestic space or someone who is expected to perform in the, in, in the marriage relation, we find that it's a difficult, it becomes a difficult life for her altogether. Once these gender roles are not seen as important, we find that the woman is denied even the other things that she likes. Herself is rooted in these many performances and beyond that there is no freedom her to articulate herself or her desire or her um, ambitions in any other form. The act of writing it plays an important role, it is like a trope. We get to know the story through these journal entries which is why there is a staccato kind of a narration, it is not a continuous flow of thoughts for reasons that uh, the story also discloses. She has to stop writing as and when someone comes in, she also in a mental state which is not really stable. The act of writing here comes across as a forbidden act which is why she is forced to hide and this is also a way in which she tries to access the freedom. The only thing that she manages to do without anyone noticing is one to write and the second thing her mental obsession with the wallpaper. She gives a free rein to her mind when she is not allowed to do any other thing. And this victory through self-expression is what she celebrates at the end when she manages to tear down the wallpaper and creeps on the floor. And at that point we find that uh, John who seems to be under control throughout the story who comes across as the one who knows what is best for his wife. We find him as a helpless being to such an extent that he even faints. And the act of writing, whether it is the writing the journal or trying to write her own story on the wallpaper that comes across a voice of dissent, there is a sense of power that she begins to assume. And uh, the story can be read as a critique of the various attitudes historically towards women writing earlier and even now and women expressing themselves were always seen as a threat. We know about the history of uh, uh, women writing in various parts of the world in different cultures where historical struggles involved in allowing women to articulate themselves, in allowing them into expressing themselves in particular genres in uh, ways which were acceptable initially only for men. We do find that this is an ongoing struggle because there are also expectations of women who are writing. There are certain kinds of things which 
are still considered as not very acceptable when it comes to women who are writing. And this is a story which challenges these many ways in which women have been historically incorporated into the act of writing or women have been historically excluded from many different genres or different kinds of themes. And this story also highlights two important things in the context of women who would like to express themselves, who would like to work and leave a mark for themselves. There have always been attempts to silence women from these different patriarchal structures, whether from within the family or from the society or from the larger institutions and structures. And there is a need to tame women as John, uh, the, the, the seemingly good character in the story feels or even the many representatives from these different social structures they continue to feel. The story is a some kind of a challenge or response to these many attempts, to these many historical instances which have, which feminist history has been witnessing. And the other way in which we can categorize this story is by looking at uh, this as a response to the androcentric hegemony, especially in medical practices in the 19th century. Um, in the the context of the yellow wallpaper, it is important to ask certain questions whether this kind of reading, whether these kinds of articulations where a woman is not allowed to express herself in the name of the ultimate good for her own self, is are these discussions still relevant or is it a thing of the past? And looking at the theme of this text where it is a direct response to the androcentric hegemony of medical practices and domestic relations in the 19th century, do we now tend to see this as a historical anchor text, a dated text or does it have a timeless narration? This is uh, something that I encourage you to read on your own and frame your responses to see how things have changed in the contemporary for women who would love to write or who would love to articulate themselves in ways which are not considered entirely acceptable by the society, the family or by these extended institutions of power. The final imagery that we see in this story of creeping women about the way they move stealthily which is also due to the subservience which they are facing and the creeping women also indicate that they are not standing and it is not a ladylike act when you find women creeping. The final imagery is in that sense very very compelling because it is showcasing the need to come out of these images in which women are expected to perform, in which women are expected to showcase themselves. The wallpaper is also a symbol of many things that the story directly and indirectly invokes. It could be tradition, the restrictions placed by the family and the society, the overarching patriarchy, the different forms of dominances. And what else do you think the wallpaper is a symbol of? In your reading, if you could uh, come up with newer kinds of things that the wallpaper begins to symbolize in the contemporary, you could perhaps think about how well it can be articulated within the structure of the story. As we wrap up this discussion, the importance of the story lies in the celebration of this emergence of a feminist consciousness. The story towards the end, we have the nameless narrator in a very exhilarating tone telling us that I have got out at last and this is very important. The woman in the wallpaper as the narrator begins to see, the woman and the women in the wallpaper, they, they succeed in getting out. It is same as a narrator who was trapped before, who was confined before, she also succeeds in getting out of the image getting out of the physical confinement and the imaginary other woman and the narrator's repressed self we find are being liberated at the same time. And this emergence of the feminist consciousness is what makes this text extremely important for all times and for all cultures because this is an expression, this is an articulation of women trying to get out and express themselves in spite of the confinements and in spite of the situations that they are forced to be in regardless of the context, regardless of the time and regardless of uh, the cultures. 
I hope you enjoyed reading this story and this needs to be looked at in the context of world literature as one of the important feminist texts which defined the ways in which feminist texts and feminist articulations have been critiqued and looked at especially in the context of the western academies. There have been different readings which also talk about the need to bring in more non-white texts as representative texts but nevertheless the 100 uh, years of celebrating this text and the way in which it has lived into the uh, present century, the way in which it has lived into the uh, uh, canon, into the feminist canon and into the alternate canon of the contemporary period makes it all the more reason to read this work as part of A Course on World Literature. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.